I want to welcome everyone back to the Pete Quinone Show. Thomas is here again, and we're going to get into part three of uh, Thomas's talk about Ernst Nolte. How you doing, Thomas? I'm doing very well. Thanks for hosting me. Of course. What I want to get into a bit today, I want to address some things that people have been asking over email and things, which is great. There's been a tremendous amount of feedback on this series, and I was pleasantly surprised by that. It's it's something of a heady topic. Like I'm, I'm not suggesting that like people aren't smart enough to comprehend it. It's just that frankly, not like you know, deep diving into into political philosophy and sort of the history of ideas in a, in a very abstract capacity. That's that's not something that you know a great number of people are taken in by, and I totally understand that. Um, but it's essential to understanding the development of, of of concrete political realities in the 20th century. And if you want to understand the our present and its 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 nuances therein, you've you've got to, you've got to understand these things as as legacy structures and legacy phenomenon of the 20th century. Um, not just because, as we've talked about, there's been a basic stagnation in America and you know the the, the former West. Even if that were not the case, even even if there was a, a an authentic dynamism to American government, and even if there had been you know a truly forward-looking and and, and far-reaching and and workable sort of a path forward in policy terms after the the collapsing of German border you know i'm thinking in terms of what you know mr nixon wrote about in his final years and as well as you know kind of the bush baker model like i'm not suggesting people should look at that as you know some ideal model or something but there was like a dynamism to it and it was relevant to you know, post Cold War realities. You know, even if there was, even if there was something like that um, extent, um, you know, in, in terms of intellectual currents as well as political will and conceptual ambition, this would still be informed almost entirely by, you know, 20th century structures, phenomena, and relationships, like different as things are today. And much as I, agree with people including mr musk who say that historical time is speeding up owing to technology that is 100 percent true um so today i want to get into some of these things and what's key to understanding about nolte and german idealism generally you know, people, especially Anglophone types, who have are marinated with a certain disdain for continental philosophy. Okay, I mean, it's just a fact. There's a tendency to dismiss these things as well. That's so much sophistry. You know, that's um, that that's just a uh, you know a not particularly lucid interpretation of political realities. You know that extrapolates the musings of of cloistered intellectuals to populations at scale. It's the wrong way to look at it. Even if you don't accept the postulates, ontological and otherwise, of Hegel, of of Nolte, of of Heidegger. Even if this is nothing more than a conceptual horizon. That became a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of how it shaped the European political mind. That's nonetheless a, a, a causal variable that is 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 inarguably just positive of outcomes. Okay. I take it a step further, obviously. I mean, I, I think it's clear to everybody that, you know, I, I'm very much a Hegelian. I think Ernst Nolte was the most profound historical thinker and writer of the 20th century 
but the way I understand German idealism is it, it's um people who deal in, in studies of consciousness and things um will be familiar with the anthropic principle. This is extraordinarily complicated, okay, um, on like its own terms. But we can't talk about political realities without talking about e events within within the human mind. Okay, it's not like there's some. It's not like there's some actual political reality remote from human psychology that is existing outside of our purview or something. Okay, we're not we're not talking about astronomical phenomena. We're not talking about you know um, e e e events of of, uh, of 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 a natural scientific you know nature, obviously. You know, um, so that renders that 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 renders uh, the study of 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 political philosophy unique, okay? Because you can't you you, can, you can't do away with with mind as a prime move on, okay? Even if you reject the postulates of somebody like Nolte, and I come back to this again and again, all right. But it's also to understand the entirety of the war, you know, this zeitgeist was the cause of the war, okay? And there was obviously, like, concrete variables, you know, relating to things like war technology and capabilities therein that upset balances of power that had basically been constant since 1648 or so. There's economic realities that, you know, affected and impacted the ability to manage populations at scale that in turn, you know, were decisive in, 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 as regards, you know, the capacity to mobilize those aforementioned populations, which in turn, you know, had, uh, had a tremendous impact on, on the perception of states engaged in a hard power competition. That goes without saying, but all of these things at key points of decision, as well as in terms of broad conceptual horizon of what the end game of these political ambitions were, can only be understood in terms of the zeitgeist. And the way that practical transcendence was changing the way humans live their lives and identify themselves and quite literally how they lived and died. Nobody was more insinuated into that modality of thought than Adolf Hitler. Okay. I'm going to begin a series on this book um, in the next week. This is an incredibly ballsy book. Uh, and it was kind of underneath the radar. It's basically a breakdown of Hitler's second book, the secret book. And um, what Sims emphasizes is that Hitler very well understood the situation geostrategically as well as historically. And I've always made the point before that Hitler's primary op was Franklin Roosevelt, not Stalin. Sims hammers that point home absolutely, okay? And in terms of Germany's mobilization paradigm, in terms of the technologies Hitler emphasized, in terms of his entire timetable, tactical and strategic, um, from September 1939 until December 1941, was oriented towards facilitating Germany's ability to defend against a massive assault by the United States that can't be that can't be overemphasized. Anybody who denies it is not in the game. However, what was happening to European peoples and what was threatening to render the culture extinct was what uh, was um what was 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 uh was purely conceptual okay and it uh it's um 
the uh, Schwerpunkt of that devastating idea or psychological tendency was, was Bolshevism. You know, Bolshevism wasn't just a, a way of ordering labor. You know, it wasn't just a, a matter of depriving people of, of certain freedoms, you know, that they had become habituated to. It wasn't just a question of breaking down traditional modalities of, of order, you know, um, whether we're talking about, you know, within the family unit or, you know, in terms of how, you know, the, the races or, or ethnic populations relate to one another or the way, you know, the sexes, you know, kind of re relate to one another in, um, as, as regards, um, you know, um, duties and responsibilities and things. In, in ontological terms, it was it, it was sharing the bases of, of 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 identity, and when you remove people from any identitarian pole stars, when you literally rip them out of history, they're no longer living as human beings in basic terms. Okay, and despite what people claim, and Sims emphasizes this too, Hitler did not claim that Europeans were some master race. Quite the contrary. Hitler said Germany's racial stock has precipitously declined since the Thirty Years' War. He looked at that as the shattering event, okay, that Germany never really recovered from. He said that the best European stock was in England, and their leadership caste basically was able to dominate a good portion of the planet, as well as preside over a divided society that had no kind of like organic, like national underpinning, you know, and they managed to do this with like a combination of um of tremendous foresight you know un unrestrained ruthlessness and you know an ability to sort of manipulate subjugated cultures in a way that incentivized you know cooperation but also quite literally you know rendering like the best that those cultures could provide to this you know um imperial whole okay hitler further said that the best european stock had emigrated to america you know so hitler's like we're basically left with like this kind of like shattered remnant of what's what was potentially you know like a like like a master race okay and Thus, it was all the more critical. It, Germany would like literally die um, from this onslaught of of uh, of suicidal zeitgeist, for lack of a better way to characterize it. Okay. Now, this wasn't just like Hitler actually believed this. Okay, it, this wasn't. I mean, this wasn't just, you know, stuff fit for the, the, the bully pulpit or, you know, before the National Socialists had anything approaching a bully pulpit. This, this wasn't just, you know, this, these weren't just like scare concepts or, or some kind of nightmare scenario to, to bring ignorant people to polls out of fear or something like that. The degree to which communism in practice like literally the praxis of communism, Marxist-Leninism, it can only it can only exist, let alone endure and perpetuate itself if it annihilates all competing conceptual horizons. You've got to deprive people of the ability to conceptualize some alternative ontology. Okay, there's no other ideology like that. That's one reason it's misplaced when we talked about it in an earlier episode. This kind of a, this simpleton's paradigm that's promoted during the Cold War of oh, there's totalitarianism and then there's democracy. Something like Franco Spain had nothing in common with the Soviet Union, a revolutionary communism generally, nor did you know some some tin pot dictatorship in the third world regimes like that forcing compliance or enforcing supervisional compliance you know by by use of the penal apparatus or or some 
or, 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 or some kind of, you know, um, use of, of military force as a, an extrajudicial means of, of punishing people and, you know, as a spectacle that communism is not interested in that for its own terms. One of the things I, I think in some ways is a very overrated writer, but Orwell captured the true essence of, of, uh, of Marxist Leninism in 1984. And that's exactly what the book's about. It's not about totalitarianism or fascism or government generally. It is about Marxist Leninism. When O'Brien says, I need you to love Big Brother, I, I don't, it's, you know, I, I'm not interested in superficial compliance. I'm not interested in forcing you to do things. You know, in fact, quite the contrary. You know, I, I, I need you to not be able to conceive of anything other than prostrating yourself in kind of like awed and terrified reverence of this megalithic state, you know, and not only do you not, you know, the reason why you don't resist it isn't out of terror. It's because you can't even conceptualize resisting it. It's like resisting God. Okay. And probably the best example of this was in Romania immediately after the war. There's um I can't remember his name now, but there was a Romanian Orthodox priest who when somebody's made a saint, are they beatified? Is that the term? Okay, I believe he was beatified. Yeah. Yeah. Um for his resistance um to the communists. But uh there was this um what came to be known as uh, the Batesti, and if I'm butchering that pronunciation again, forgive me, the Batesti prison experiments. Okay, um, Batesti prison. Now, Romania is a fascinating example because Ceausescu was was a, was a he, he was viewed kind of in the West as this bizarre eccentric. Obviously, you know, him and his wife were were, were summarily executed on on live television and that was shocking like i think we've talked about before you know as a teenager seeing that on this this was long before live league and anything like three guys one hammer or any of this horrible stuff that you can anybody can see on the internet and um but i mean obviously it was the only violent overthrow of a of of an east Bloc regime but you know um for all practical purposes romania had seceded from warsaw pact you know, Ceausescu himself, he negotiated with Kennedy to remove Romania from the SIOP target list and event a nuclear war. But in terms of, the, despite kind of like seceding entirely from Weltpolitik, Romania kind of perfected um, Marxist Leninism as regards its internal situation. I mean, purists will say, well, it was a personality cult, but that's not what I'm talking about. Um, most of the detainees at the Potesti prison were, were were men who'd served in the Iron Guard. You know, they were uh, they were um, you know, uh, Ost Front veterans who, you know, were um, company level officers or higher. There were priests um, who hadn't done anything wrong. I mean, even of a you know political nature, and they were psychologically tortured, according to this phased paradigm. Um, the first phase would involve um, this kind of like endless interrogation over days and weeks. Um, with torture liberally applied under the auspices of revealing intimate details. This was called external unmasking. But the interrogators, I mean, they obviously that any any kind of anything relating to somebody's intimate moral or, or sexual behavior, they'd find that valuable to exploit against them. But this wasn't this wasn't the purpose of, of external unmasking. They'd force people to do things like 
you know, they'd say, you know, it's come to our attention that, you know, like your father was actually like a, like a traitor, you know, and, or like, you know, it's, it's, you, you were actually born a bastard, you know, and then we, we've, we've discovered this or like, you know, your, your sister was a prostitute, you know, and, and she had many men, you know, and we, 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 we've talked to men who, who, you know, who visited her and, and, and in relations with her for money. And, um, they'd insist on this over and over and over and over again. And, you know, they torture people into signing confessions uh, and stuff that seems apparently meaningless from a political perspective. But victims subsequently attested that you, you start losing touch with reality under these conditions. And you start wondering, you know, like, is that actually true? You know what I mean? I, I'm sure people will say, like, well, that, that would never happen to me. Very, very strange things happen when people are incarcerated. And add to that literal it, torture. It doesn't, it doesn't even have to be incarceration. Um, I've witnessed people in my own life um, who went to group therapy uh -huh. and started, started adopting stories that they heard other people tell as their own. And they probably, they believe it. Yeah. And 100% yeah. believe it. It's... The human mind is, I, I don't know what that is. I, it, it's hard for me to, uh, to, underst to understand that, but I've seen it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you're a worldly guy. And I mean, obviously, I mean, you, frankly, you spend a fair amount of time with, with, with matters of the human psyche because it relates to, you know, um, what are our, our, our mutual emphases and things. But yeah, it um, you know the second the second phase was called uh, like internal unmasking. Now, this what this was us um, at least uh, nominally. It was uh, the torturer slash interrogator. He demanded to know what guards or trustees or other interrogators had been lenient with the subject. So basically this was, you know, and say like, you know, basically like, you know, I now in this perverse way, you know, it, it's, it's a way of trying to, trying to literally create like Stockholm syndrome or to generate those sorts of misplaced sympathies in the mind of the victim. Um, you know, uh, so it came to um, the, uh, the, you know, the, the victim would in some cases begin to look at his torture as truly benevolent, you know, because even if it was totally a, a, a charade, you know, the fact that he would disclose, you know, um, persons who'd shown him leniency and then he'd be rewarded with, you know, maybe if he'd been subjected to a starvation diet, he'd be rewarded with food or something, or even just, you know, the appearance of, of, of affection, like perverse as it sounds, um, you know, people do need affection, um, or, or approval in some basic sense. And somebody who's, somebody who's, um, been utterly destroyed, whose internal constitution has been destroyed um by a deliberate and purposeful you know regime of torture even 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 the approval of of their torturer you know who's cast himself in in some kind of fatherly role you know you see you see the police do this too anyone's been subject to police interrogation obviously they, they, it's not nearly this extreme okay um but that's that's basically what good cop bad cop is and some very dumbed down and obviously much less insidious and 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 literally figuratively violent um sense it's um the uh the third stage was uh the third phase it was this um it, it was this it was this kind of public humiliation ritual if the person was a, uh, you know, if they were, um, if they were a priest or a, or a, 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 a lay person in the Orthodox Church, you know, the interrogator would do something like, you know, laying out a crucifix and like demanding that you urinate on it, 
you know, if uh, it was a political partisan or like a former like Wehrmacht officer or Iron Guard um, revolutionary, you know, they might like force him to like like drink urine or like literally like lick the boots of his interrogator or something or like, you know, claim to have engaged in, in, in like disgusting sexual acts or something. Um, you know, in this, like E. Michael Jones, not specifically about this in this context, but you know, he's talked about how part of the subtext of the kind of like normalization of pornography is uh, the kind of like assault the intimate moral core of the person, you know, and 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 rip away any any kind of private um, and, and any kind of truly like private um, boundaries they have, you know, and that that's a real thing too, you know. Um, but this was, um, you know, these uh, people were people were permanently and profoundly damaged by this. I mean, beyond the obvious. I mean, like you said, you don't the things people think they take for granted. They 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 no longer can. Like they're not they're not capable of it. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about like trust in in authority in, in some basic way. I mean, like they're not fully human anymore there's no fault of their own obviously but it this guy named robert graves is you know um an english man of letters type of you know like a great war veteran his memoir was called goodbye to all that robert conquest cited him and for comparative purposes in his in his book on a communist megacide Graves was talking about the experience at the front, okay, during World War One, and he said that he said the Graves said that like the squalor and danger of the front lines, being under constant bombardment, you know, uh, like living in filth. He said that like young officers, he said they they said after after several weeks they begin to deteriorate a little. He's like after six months. He's like, most men were basically all right, but they were starting to show cracks. Okay. Is after nine or 10 months, these guys became a drag on fellow officers and NCOs. You know, like they were no longer thinking clearly. You know, they, um, they, uh, they, 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 they'd become desocialized owing to constant anxiety. You know, he'd say after a year or 15 months of continuous service, he said even like the most robust and healthy um junior officer would basically be useless you know he, he was no longer fit for command you know um at best you know only to his experience and whatnot you know if he still had the nerve and the gumption for direct action you know uh he might be able to utilize in like the equivalent of a stormtrooper role but as, in a command role, not e not even close. He said the real tragedy, though, he said guys over the age of about 30 or 35, and especially over 40, he said that the uh, these guys had less resistance. You know, um, and in his estimation, it's because they had, you know, decades of normal life to compare their current situation to. He said... Officers over 40, he said at the six months mark, almost unfailingly became, you know, obvious alcoholics. You know, um, they they don't want to be able to, you know, assuming they've survived multiple assault operations, they could only they could only function if they were totally drunk. Um he said that they started seeming, you know, complete like he said they started seeming literally um, you know, like in a state of shock at all times. You know, he said some of them lost their ability to communicate in basic terms, like their ability to their command of language had left them, you know. Um, and Conquest says that something that developed in Soviet society, especially after about 1936 to 38, about 1936, 1938 onward until about 1957, he said it was something, he, he said it was something completely comparable particularly guys who were in roles that were somewhat coveted, 
where they were in contact with commissars at all times and responsible for their people, but they weren't protected by, you know, the largesse or the patronage of, of party men. Like a good example would be, you know, like a doctor at a hospital, you know, who like, like a surgeon who was responsible for, you know, more junior doctors and nurses, obviously, or like a professor of geology, you know, or like a guy who worked at one of the design bureaus, you know, like overseeing other engineers, you know, he'd be under constant pressure of the commissars. Um, you know, he, and so it is, his whole family would constantly be under surveillance. He'd be subjected to things like, you know, when people he worked closely with were taken away and either executed summarily or sentenced to sentenced to the, the death camp system, he'd be ordered he'd be directed to sign a statement saying that he fully approved of these measures against people who were engaged in counter revolutionary activities, regardless of his personal feelings about them. And like over time, this just broke people down. You know, and the workers and pet the workers and peasants who supposedly the Soviet state was directly um was 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 oriented towards you know like elevating you know um the these people a huge amount of them and we'll get into some of these figures in a minute had cycled through the forced labor system and they and they began acting they just they began behaving like convicts you know, in all the, in all the pathological ways that you know people who are in and out of the prison system do. You know, and even if they didn't have you know pathologies going in, despite being branded as criminals, they certainly had them when they were released. And that's what I mean. That's what's unique about Sovietism, and that's what's unique about communism. You know, and the people who. I mean, it'd be easy for it's it's easy for people to say like, oh well, that's their own fault. You know, why weren't there cadres of people who who were who were cultivating resistance to this to this this regime? They were all dead. They were slaughtered. Um, the Soviets slaughtered ten million people by the time by by you know before a shot was fired in the Second World War. You know, and that's nobody's old point. Um, the people who are capable of of harboring a conceptual vista of some alternative system, they 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 were they were they were killed categorically, regardless of age, sex, overall health, national origin, <clears throat> because they were the they were the standard. If even if they weren't the standard bearers of the enemy idea. You know they 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 weren't malleable in the way that they needed to be. You know the Khmer Rouge actually perfected this. That's what Year Zero is. You know, left revisionists who like Sartre, who actually understood Marxist Leninism. You know they were constantly trying to extricate the Khmer Rouge experience from revolutionary communism as like a postulate into itself this is some bizarre outlier this is an example of oriental barbarism you know this has nothing to do with 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 rational state behavior you know there's nothing we can extrapolate from that he knew that that was not true okay um aside from the kind of atavistic mythologies that you know the Khmer Rouge threw in to kind of woo the the peasantry towards their perspective and you know and, and whatever like racial mythologies that um were emphasized when they were fighting the Vietnamese like that notwithstanding um Pol Pot was actually a very learned man and what he aside from the fact that you know Cambodia democratic Cambodia as it was so dubbed, was a was a backwater that was devoid of the prerequisite industry to facilitate, you know, the realization of true communism. And in political terms, he was absolutely a pure communist. Um, and that's what's required in order to facilitate its realization. It's not, it's not an outlier in the least. Um, and people who are honest 
like um orthodox marxists who remained in you know moscow adjacent after the after you know the 1960s schism they it's subtle but it's there like they acknowledge that i find this fascinating but not for the reason some people might think um no nah, not merely so i can wave it around as some you know gotcha like i it, obviously it's like grotesque people think that way but it's it's entirely consistent with uh the overall paradigm and it would be dishonest for anyone who ascribes that perspective to claim otherwise but you know the end result it, it, as, as there's no these point too when you're talking about these monumental ideas you know there you, you can't just look at them as historical contingencies you know you, you've got to look at them as not just as as as, as causal um as ultimate causal variables in and of themselves but as um phenomena that uh if that but phenomena that um endure in, until their full realization or until they are annihilated because the the because the bearers of um the idea are annihilated the mention material of it um the purpose of communism is to realize communism it's not just to alleviate tensions inherent to you know opposing classes amidst um historical evil it's not just a way to you know kind of placate a, a radicalized proletariat you know in the short term and, and, and until um you know some sort of new structure that has more equitable outcomes can be realized like the point of it quite literally is it's it's self-contained realization and um the end result of the communist enterprise is is the eradication of culture and that was the great horror in the minds of all who opposed it and you know like i said one of the only meaningful things in absolute terms you can take from mein kampf is when hitler says that a bolshevized planet is a planet without culture where all men you know live basically as basically as animals with the power of speech you know and the earth the earth is uh the 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 earth is 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 basically this you know this ball of mud like spinning through the void with no with no with no higher life you know um everything you associate with culture from the comparatively prosaic the most profound no longer exists you know it's 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 the world as labor you know um there is no past there's no future there's only the present and you know the realization of work quotas or you know the homogenization of life um such that it's rendered indistinguishable but for you know geographic location which anymore has no meaning other than you know a, a the signature on a map and um that much, much as people might have misanthropic fantasies about earth without people i think that was actually like some corny show like decades ago it was like it was like earth without people or like the world without man and it was um i think it was on discovery or something like forgive the tangent and it was um you know there was these like cgi rendered landscapes where uh you know like skyscrapers are all overgrown and and just like animals are have free reign and there's no more man to you know uh, corrupt like the the pure sanity of nature or something but that you know people have this idea that somehow like without like the without without the human mind to perceive things that these things might may well as not not exist you know um I'm mean, not sure go without saying, but it's 
I guess it's like the way people like imagine like what their own funeral would look like as if they'd have <laughs> some, some kind of some kind of vantage point or something, you know, and in 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 the terms you would, you know, as in in you know, in, in as a as a living human with you know optic nerves and things. But um let, let me you you said that the purpose of communism is its realization. What's the purpose of national socialism? The posterity of the of the Volk and more immediately that's what I'm gonna get into in uh this pod series I'm gonna do. Um the regeneration of the European form of life to meet the challenges of the 21st century, you know, to render its mentioned material competitive, at least able to survive onslaught by what Hitler identified as, you know, kind of like the, the nascent Anglo-Saxon, um, hegemony or hegemon Hitler accurately um that's another thing about the about the sims book that i think needs to be emphasized hitler was incredibly and, and he, he he knew exactly what was underway in terms of the strategic historical situation and the second book he makes the point that america contains about fully 50 percent of the world's like actual like capital and resources you know he says that once fully mobilized america will be unstoppable he said it'll be unlike any hegemon the world's ever seen and he said that you know unless um unless some sort of total regeneration occurs in europe um he wasn't talking in, in some kind of stressorist notion of you know like a united states of europe like literally like a palingenetic revival of the race um you know and he had he, he, hitler had no use for petted nationalism but um his idea of a european superpower was very different than what people like the stressor suggested is my point but he said that you know unless this happens assuming that assuming germany could fend off a Soviet assault, which at present, then present being, you know, 1933, it, it could not. But he said, even if it could, he said that Europe would basically become, you know, the battleground between the United States and the Soviet Union for world hegemony, which is exactly what happened. And he said that, uh, you know, the danger of the Soviet Union is the danger that's always been presented by Europe, which is essentially an, an indefensible peninsula you know, populated by a world minority of peoples um, facing uh, without, without any, without any, you know, there's no Sahara desert in Europe. There's no sort of like natural rampart, you know, um, there, the, you know, the, the immediate physical threat to European civilization is the billion strong hordes of the of the barbarian east you know but he said that this is um you know the uh the the graver like absolute like literally global threat is um is america you know because it's it's a complete it, because it, it's completely it completely like neutralizes everything people had there to be taken for granted about hard power and the capacity to marshal capital in the service of hard power. Um, how he viewed the American people is nuanced. And fascinatingly, and Sims gets into this too, um, despite this kind of like, like this, this ongoing kind of liberal fixation with like, Oh, Hitler was a Confederate and he loved slavery and hated black people. Hitler said almost nothing about black people other than that he said that transplanting, you know, hundreds of thousands of African slaves to the New World, he said was he, he said was uh something that 
reminiscent of, of an artifact of a barbaric civilization. And he said it was beneath America to do that. And totally unnecessary. You know, he admired the kind of northern industrial might of uh, the Union. He uh, said that, you know, the cream of German racial stock to the tune of 5.9 million people over a few centuries had emigrated to America. He's like, these people are the backbone of uh, American power, you know. Um, and he said that, uh, you know, some of the best of of, uh, of the Anglophone leadership cast has sort of like assimilated them into their own ranks. Like he's basically saying like, this is this is a recipe for utterly like unstoppable power and like full spectrum dominance, like economic, military, cultural, in every conceivable way, you know, but he said that there's like an underlying rootlessness there that's very much been co-opted, you know, by a, a, a Jewish modernist perspective. This is different than the threat. It's different, but related in terms of a constellation of 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 um of zeitgeist related factors like writ large. It's different than you know the Soviet threat, but it's it's derived from the same. It, it's derived from the same historical crisis. Okay. Um, and he makes the point in the second book that it's not accidental that you know, Americanism and Sovietism will, like, find common cause for limited purposes because they're not actually Manichaean opposites. There's, like, there's irreconcilable differences between them. You know, he said, given conditions of parity, they destroy each other, but but they're they're not, like, mortal enemies or something, you know, in absolute terms. And, um, but that's, I didn't mean to go so far, like, a field, but it, um, the, uh, what I did want to get a little bit into, and forgive me if I'm jumping around a bit, um, a lot of people over uh, over email and whatnot, they've been asking in comparative terms about like to what degree like the Soviet Union had like a camp system. And I make the point, and I'm relying on Con Robert Conquest for this. The Soviets had a death camp system writ large. Its purpose was to categorically exterminate people. Um, there were there were hundreds of these camps um, purpose towards that end in the frozen um, you know tundra of uh, what was the Soviet Far East. This is the territory, I mean, for people keen to like geology and you know, the like earth science and stuff. I mean, this is, uh, this is literally, you know, um, like the ice age, you know, like world Island, you know, this is where the, this is the, this is where the polar bear develops. This is the, this is where mammoths stalked the land, you know, until 50,000 years ago or whatever, you know, um, conquest called it an empire of camps that existed from 1931 until approximately 1957. And I mean, the scale of this, uh, in 1930, mid 1930, as this, as the security apparatus was sort of consolidating and leaving behind the revolutionary phase and developing into a, a, a like, like a true kind of penal system and extermination system to categorically manipulate population outcomes in, in mortal, mortal terms. Um, by that point, um, the OGPU was the precursor to the NKVD, which was the precursor to the KGB. It was constantly reconstituting itself in these days, which I believe uh, was very purposeful to make it difficult to identify what spheres of responsibility were and the I mean the, the the communists were singularly obsessed with manipulating the historical record for reasons that are obvious i mean we that's what we've been talking about this past hour but um 
you know, this was, uh, I mean, Stalin famously literally, you know, like would redact people from the record, you know, only photographic evidence of them. But one of the reasons why, I mean, any rigorous historian, real like it's if understand that if anything the the death toll presented even by rigorous revisionist like conquest is is understated but um superficially um this kind of uh constant manipulation of vernacular and nomenclature provided um uh, provided the soviets with an alibi and and they're and they're historical apologists today and in in some sense despite the ubiquity of information that it, it, it has the same function but what's inarguable is that by mid-1930 there's approximately 140,000 prisoners already in these camps run by the gpu um initially these sort of huge labor projects the first of which was digging a canal from connecting the white sea to the baltic um which for perspective, this alone required well over a hundred thousand laborers, okay? Um and um what better way to avail a labor pool than you know to to um to capture tens of thousands of of, of able bodied men, you know, who either um are categorized as you know political unreliables. Or members of ethnic groups that have been, you know, determined to be, you know, unassimilable, or or resistant to, um, you know, the uh, the kind of uh, de ethnification of peoples. Um, you know, you you can brand these men criminals, and then you know you can essentially work them to death on these um. On these massive uh, public work projects, you know, as, as as slaves, literally, um, even worse. I mean, they're expendables. You know, um, you don't you don't work your slaves to death. You know, um, if um, on, under, you know, on, on, under ordinary conditions of a chattel slavery, but um, from 1930 onward, the number of people receiving some kind of custodial sentence just astronomically rose um in 1929 there was somewhere between 50 and 60 thousand people who were sentenced by the ogpu um a year later this was there was over 200 thousand um but in 1931 it was 1,230,000 i mean this is this is astronomical okay um, and we're talking about, you know, we're not talking about a matter of decades, we're talking about the span of a year, you know, um, the, the, the camp, the population in these camps, um, you know, labor camps and death camps, you know, um, increasing fivefold over, you know, a million people. Um, there was, a uh, within this far Eastern camp system. There's between 100 and 160 camps at any given time. This absolutely dwarfs the camp system of the Third Reich. I mean, absolutely dwarfs it. Even if you accept at face value everything alleged at Nuremberg, you know, it's um it's 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 comparing an ant to an elephant. Um the OGPU further in 1932 absorbed. 700 small penal colonies and um and uh jails and prisons you know where the people have been serving sentences from anything from petty theft to, to homicide um these camps and prisons have formerly been run by what's called the people's commissariat of justice and um the ogpu declared that you know these were being inefficiently administered so they absorbed, you know, what amounted to the, to the conventional, you know, prison population and um, began working these people to death, you know, um, on these public works projects. Um, on January 1st, on New Year's Day, 1935, this newly unified system, according to Soviet records, there was nine or 
50,000 prisoners in it. Over 700,000 were in work camps and 240,000 were in work colonies. Now, mind you, and, and reading between the lines, and Congress made this point, um, there was these discrete smaller units, and there's no explanation for why they were so organized. Presumably, that's where actual dangerous criminals were housed. But everybody else, um, the overwhelming majority had done nothing at all wrong. But um, everything in the Soviet Union, under what was called Article 58, which was this catch-all um, penal law, absenteeism from work was a crime, destroying Soviet property was a crime, hooliganism, which translates approximately to like disorderly conduct, that was a crime. You know, so that's one of the reasons why I get really, really irritated when people who some of them don't know any better, I guess, even in our own circles, like talk, about, they refer to people as criminals. I'm like, don't, I'm like, don't, don't start doing that. Okay. Um, I mean, maybe I feel strongly about this considering my own background, but um, you've lost your kind of groundedness when you start calling people criminals as some categorical element. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, for perspective, this was that this 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 was well known. You know, one of the things people attack Nolte and his thesis, claiming like, oh, nobody knew it was underway in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was a nascent superpower. And this was it was nothing like today, but um film was ubiquitous. Um there was an international newswire, you know. Um it's not like Moscow was thousands of miles away from Europe. This was well known, you know. Um, people um, and people, uh, these cadres who had fought in Bavaria, you know, um, and in the Baltic against the Free Corps. I mean, these people would have been trained in the Soviet Union, you know the. Um, Furthermore, you know, by 1936, there was a, a truly international proxy conflict in Spain. You know, um, this this idea that information somehow was was quarantined, you know, and didn't cross national frontiers. I mean, that that's that, that's laughable. You know, it's um, this was this was common knowledge. You know, um, and plus, I mean, how exactly, you know. Hundreds of thousands of people over the course of the decade, millions of people were, were categorically disappearing. You think people weren't noticing that? <laughs> you know, um, upon the Soviet assault on Poland, you know, um, a huge number, about a quarter million Poles disappeared within months. You know, um, not just because, uh, I mean, the, the Russians, there, were, there, was, um, there was ethnic hostility um, between the Russians and Poles. Anyway, that was arguably as severe as that between, you know, the, the Germans and the Poles or the Poles and the Jews or the Germans and the Jews. But, um, you know, you think uh, people, people weren't noticing that, you know, um, the tens of thousands of Poles were just disappearing. Their entire officer corps just disappeared. You know, <laughs> the entire, like, Warsaw clergy just disappeared. I mean, like, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm not trying to be obtuse or like make it out like it's funny or something, you know, or every flipping rather about um these kinds of human tragedies. But um, uh, it's, it's so it's like a non-argument. It's not, it's it's just it's on its face. It's it's laughable. But um, the uh, you know, I I, I emphasize this too. And I mean, again, I <clears throat> I'm the first person to make the point that it's not, you know, like a, a like a historical revisionism is not some kind of numbers game but because what is in contention is the degree of attrition in comparative terms and this really was not just the subtext but kind of the part of the core controversy of uh the historic strike i i want people to contemplate again the degree to which the 
the Soviet camp apparatus utterly dwarfed that of the German Reich. And like Nolte said, other than other than homicidal gas chambers, the degree to which they were employed is arguable. I don't want to get into that in this um, series. Not because I'm afraid to or something reverse to. We can talk about Fred Leuchter and Robert Farson and the entire controversy if if people want to. But that's but the point is, even if you accept all of that at face value, every single thing that the Third Reich did was precedented by the Soviet Union, with the exception of homicidal gas chambers employed against civilian populations. So the entire kind of notion of, oh, Sonderweg led to this unique and intractable evil. Just look at, you know, look look at the Third Reich, this, this regime that existed for the sole purpose of realizing a, a homicidal conspiracy. I mean, it's it, it's laughable. I mean, it's there's nothing funny about it, but it's it's preposterous, rather. Um, that's about um, this. I got some more stuff to say about this, but I don't want to. I would you be agreeable or amenable um, if we did a part four, but we fielded questions from subscribers, and I could just kind of tie up loose ends, man. I don't want to tell you your business with content. Sure. Okay, yeah, yeah I'd appreciate that, man. Um, and I hope this wasn't too like scatter shot. Um, no. but yeah, I, I prefer that, man. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. we'll do that, we'll, we'll schedule that. Um, do your plugs and we'll end this. You can always find me on my website, it's thomas777.com. It's number seven, hmas777.com. You can find me on Twitter, it's uh, at um real thomas at capital r e a l underscore number seven h m a s seven 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 um i'm on instagram um my main my main platform is substack that's where you can find my long form stuff and um the podcast and um, you can find me on YouTube. It's at Thomas TV. Also, excuse me. Also, have links from my website. Also, have links from Substack. Um, Seek and you shall find. I'm a. Uh, I um. I dropped a video sit rep today on my Substack. Not because I love hearing myself talk, but I, I felt like I owed the subscribers an explanation for kind of where we're going with things. Um. So I, if you are a subscriber, please um, check that out. Um, I, I take this very seriously and very personally, and I I do not take for granted the the love and support I get from all of you people. It's it's tremendous. Okay, um, but that's that's all I got. Uh, same. We have some great people on our side. Indeed. Thanks, Thomas. Yeah, Appreciate thank you. It.